Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for attending this talk. Um, uh, I'm very happy and honored to be here today with all you all. Um, my name is Anthony Kim, and I'm from uh, Samsung Research America. So Samsung Research America is a subsidiary of Samsung Electronics, and that's in uh, Mountain View, California. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a machine learning approach to time-sensitive uh, data analysis. At the higher level, uh, it will be about uh, how we turn uh, machine data into smart data to better understand uh, the user behaviors. Uh, okay, and uh, this uh, talk would not have been made possible without the uh, contribution of my team members. So I would like to thank uh, Jaemun and Sai for their contribution in machine learning. And I would like to thank Byonjin, Chanmuk, uh, Jinbom, and Wangun for their work in feature engineering. So feature engineering is like a huge work uh, that has to be done. Uh, and I also thank uh, Kwang Hyun and Vivi Chu Lee for uh, managing and support. And they are, uh, and uh, we are the team that is like a multinational. So uh, the work has to be done remotely and sometimes in person, and that was a lot of work. I really thank all of the team members for their contributions. So the big picture, and as well as the mission, uh, what we do is uh, we turn big data uh, into smart data. So when I say big data, it's um, uh, usually a machine-oriented uh, data that is uh, event uh, level. So uh, Samsung has lots of uh, products, and uh, uh, the products actually generate a lot of uh, events. And uh, we uh, take those event level data and then uh, transform that into a smart data to understand user behaviors. And that's possible through what we call audience science. So audience science is a set, uh, set of uh, 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 technologies to analyze user behavior and understand user behavior so that we extract uh, business insight out of uh, the user behaviors. And why we are doing that uh, is because we want to do uh, drive a value creation. And what kind of uh, value creation we want to do uh, the, uh, is as follows. So we want to do, first of all, uh, get uh, actionable uh, business insight for executives. And we also, at the same time, uh, understand user uh, mainly to serve them better and uh, make their uh, product uh, use experience better. And uh, uh, what we all want to uh, achieve is uh, satisfy our uh, product users as much as possible. And lastly, uh, we want to actually increase the efficiency in uh, analyzing big data. So when you talk about big data, it's a huge amount of data, and that's costly to analyze. Uh, and uh, we want to actually make it efficient so that uh, we uh, easily extract insight, uh, we easily just, uh, better serve our users, and, uh, and, and that's the main thing that we want to do. And how we want to do is the following. So we want to actually in interconnect all of those things uh, together, devices and users and smart TV apps and uh, smart TV services and markets connect them all together using location and time information. Uh, and that's our goal. Uh, during this talk, I'll be focused on how we use uh, temporal information. So I already uh, mentioned uh, machine-oriented the organic logs. So we see a large volume of data daily. Uh, it's about uh, more than uh, several terabytes a day compressed. If you uncompress it, it's even larger. And uh, due to the large size, uh, it is very costly to do it on a, on a regular basis. I mean, uh, analyzing, extracting insight, and so on. There are two main kinds of data my team deals with every day. So one is uh, ACR logs. So ACR stands for uh, automatic content recognition, which means that we automatically uh, recognize uh, the publicly available content broadcasted on air uh, so that we know who watches what TV content for how long time. The other kind of data we analyze is smart home logs. Uh, that tells us how uh, our users navigate through TV menus, uh, 
uh, Azure as uh, what kinds of app, what specific smart TV app they use, uh, and what TV features they like. So uh, we analyzed those two main, thing, main uh, lines of data and then turn that machine logs into uh, human-centric data. That's smart data we call, uh, we actually talk about. And uh, one of the, uh, some of the uh, smart data so it includes the hierarchical sessions, user profiles, user segments, household profiles, and household segments, and so on. So we use those smart data and move for, uh, uh, forward to uh, build a human behavior model and then understand user better and then uh, uh, serve user better. So it's going to be about uh, the set of three uh, things, observe customers, and know our customers and serve customers, and it's uh, circulating. Uh, and that's our uh, uh, business-driven business. That's what we aim to do, uh, using AI and all that uh, big data technologies. And these are the application of a, uh, the smart data. So we want to use machine learning and data mining models uh, with smart data we have, we generate, to do uh, targeted advertising and marketing and personalization, a lot of personalization, uh, including a recommendation of content and recommendation of goods and so on. Uh, here I, I describe a little bit about okay, what I mean by with session. Previously I talked about okay, hierarchical sessionization and, uh, and here is a very simple example of a, a sessionization, not about hierarchical though. Uh, so, uh, the devices like smart TV send event to a centralized uh, servers. And uh, I said it's a event level because uh, whenever uh, some event happen, it describes, okay, what happened at what time. Uh, I joined Samsung four years ago, and at the time, uh, I couldn't even see uh, the local time. It was all UTC. So basically, at what time, who, uh, did what. So for example, Anthony watched uh, some TV show, season one, episode one, on some channel. There is one event, and that is repeating. If I actually uh, stayed on the same program, that's repeating until the completion of watch behavior, right? So uh, what we want to do is, instead of looking at those uh, a lot of events, uh, we want to actually consolidate uh, those events with the same state into one data point. And that, that uh, one data point is what we call uh, the session. And that the process to consolidate data point into sessions is called a sessionization. So here we see one program watch session. Okay, Anthony watched this program, season one, episode one, at, uh, at uh, channel one, from 8 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. So that is one session. And, uh, and since we deal with a, a, a large volume of data, uh, four years ago, it was possible to do sessionization with uh, technology like Spark. But uh, nowadays, I cannot uh, uh, even think about it with the, uh, without um, doing it without a Spark. So we use Spark extensively for this uh, sessionization work. And uh, recently, we moved forward to do a more sophisticated sessionization called hierarchical session, sessionization. So what, this, uh, what does this do is the following. So it introduces multiple layers, uh, from top layers to layer six. And uh, on top layer, what we do is okay, consolidate uh, the uh, events, telling us about uh, uh, when the TV was turned on and when the TV was turned off. By considering those all events, we know okay, from what time to what time the TV was stayed on, and then use that information to understand okay, how long people use TVs. Uh, on the le next layer, layer two, we consider the event by uh, HDMI port. Uh, so uh, what that means is the panel display session uh, has a, I mean, is connected to one or more uh, input source sessions. 
And uh, so it's basically breaking the panel display session into multiple input source sessions. And we see okay, how much time was spent on HDMI port 1, HDMI port 2, and so on. And we know when you switch from okay, port A to another uh, port, say, B. Layer 3, we also get uh, the information on the type of devices connected to specific uh, HDMI port. And that is possible because a lot of HDMI devices is, uh, are self-describing themselves, telling us, OK, what is the name of the device and what is the manufacturer name? So by using that information, we know, OK, how much time you spend on what type of uh, devices. For example, uh, set-up boxes or game consoles, uh, Blu-ray players, and so on. And uh, moving on to layer four, so since we know the type of uh, the devices, we also know uh, uh, what exact model you're using, whether it was uh, uh, the Microsoft game console or Sony game console, and so on. And that way, we also see okay, how popular uh, each device is looking at uh, the data. Layer five, uh, if we are using uh, devices like uh, set-up box uh, devices. And, and, and that device is to view uh, the TV content, the linear TV programming or uh, the cable or TV programming. So when you, when you do that, uh, you have a uh, technology called HDR to recognize what channel you're on and what program you're watching. And so, Oh, the HDMI, no, actually, uh, input source session and uh, uh, device session can be connected to the content provider sessions as well as uh, content sessions. And uh, this is very powerful because we know uh, uh, how popular any given program is at any uh, given day. And uh, that is very uh, powerful thing to, uh, for us to understand, okay, what kind of program you're interested in, what channels you like, and so on. Here I talk about uh, the proprietary uh, the technology called Samsung Taste Graph, and I'm the uh, principal uh, inventor of this technology. So this is a, uh, Samsung's uh, trademark and patented technology to understand uh, a program watching behavior uh, in the following way. So uh, we see uh, the historical data, the six months long uh, viewership data, and see okay, what uh, TV programmings were available in the past okay, six months. And then uh, um, group those programs into uh, 22 different uh, buckets, the taste buckets. And that includes uh, six sports, uh, football, baseball, basketball, uh, ice hockey, soccer, and golf, and uh, uh, those are six sports game uh, categories. And we also have comedy, drama, reality, talk show, and news. So a lot of people are interested in watching those uh, kinds of programs. And we also have animation, the education, the food, cooking, uh, food slash cooking, actually, and documentary. We also have music, fashion, travel, and business slash finance. Uh, and we also have action, science fiction, and kids categories as well. So there are 22 categories that Tastecraft uses. So it's looking, uh, it is possible because we have a, uh, uh, sessions, uh, historical sessions, and then can compute uh, how much time you spend your time on specific type of programs. Now we talk about 22 different types of programs. And uh, since we, I can, uh, we can do compute, uh, how many time you spend on each of those uh, types of programs, uh, uh, we can say, OK, you have uh, this many uh, tastes uh, belonging to you. The, the uh, taste graph uh, was invented to overcome the limitation of the clustering algorithms and like k-means. So in, uh, by default, when you use k-means, uh, each cluster, uh, so each user uh, cannot belong to multiple clusters. 
and, and each user has to belong to uh, one cluster. That's the uh, limitation. Also, you have to set uh, what the K is, like how many clusters you want. Uh, we wanted to overcome that limitation, and we wanted to do the computation uh, efficiently. Uh, that's why uh, Tastecraft was uh, built, invented. Um, so this Tastecraft is widely used within Samsung uh, uh, these days. Uh, so I wanted to uh, introduce. Uh, since I mean, the, my talk is like, uh, my journey, as well as Samsung's journey from the machine data to smart data, I and mean, this is part of it. Moving forward, uh, we wanted to do more intelligent things. So uh, instead of looking at uh, events or sessions uh, happen at any uh, time, uh, let's uh, actually view a uh, day as this way, the horizon, uh, horizontal blocks of time. What we do is break the time into uh, multiple time blocks in series. So for example, one day can be uh, broken into okay, 48 time slices, uh, 30 minutes each. Uh, and when you do that, uh, you can view the time from a slightly different angle, vertically. Since uh, uh, days are stacked uh, vertically, if you view this time slice column, uh, it's a way to view the historical uh, information happened uh, during this specific time slot. And n can be any arbitrary number. Uh, so what we do is uh, we look uh, at your historical uh, behavior uh, form during this, uh, any specific time slice, and n can be year or many uh, years. So one of the uh, time uh, unit was uh, time slices. We also use day of week. Only difference is instead of days, we use weeks. So uh, on Monday, uh, in week one, uh, what was observed? How much time you use TV uh, on Mondays in the past n weeks? and Tuesday in the past n weeks. Uh, and comparing that number to other days of the week, uh, what's the fraction of your time spent on Monday and Tuesday and so on? We also have uh, weekdays and weekends as a different time units. So how much time you, you watch TV during weekdays versus weekend? That's also an important piece of information. Um, we also have day parts. The day parts are a commonly used time unit for uh, uh, the advertising businesses. So we have prime time, late news, and so on. So uh, during any given day part, uh, what was the uh, observation? So we fill in all of those blanks and then use those uh, information to drive intelligence using machine learning and data, mi uh, data mining models. So before moving forward, actually, I wanted to mention okay, the application of these uh, time-sensitive features, we call it time-sensitive features, uh, are the proprietary time-sensitive test graph. Uh, so I talked about test graph, and the difference here is uh, we want to know what your tastes are at uh, some given time uh, unit. So your tastes uh, may change depending on what, day, what time of the day it is, or what day of the week it is right now. So we wanted to capture your taste uh, depending on uh, time unit that we use. Also, there is a, a proprietary quality score. So that is to measure the relevant score between user and any given content. And that's for our, uh, that was developed to actually uh, help uh, Samsung's own advertising business. So, uh, so far, we talked about uh, statistics, how we use statistics to drive value creation. And this slide, I start to talk about okay, machine learning. So we haven't talked about machine learning, how we use machine learning yet. Uh, now, since we have a lot of uh, hierarchical sessions, and we have uh, 
a time-sensitive feature, so to speak. Uh, we can transform uh, those uh, time-sensitive information into uh, feature vectors that machine learning can use. Uh, and it's not only uh, time-sensitive features. We also have uh, keyword-based features. So based on the, the program you watched in the past uh, n days, what were the common keywords? Yeah. What were the occurrences of each keyword? And what were the occurrences of some popular uh, program titles? And, uh, and how many times you watched the program for uh, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, one hour, and so on, or more than one hour. So uh, we tweaked the features, we tweaked information that way, and came up with uh, more than 7,000 features, and uh, used those features for uh, the demographics prediction. And this is household level demographics prediction. So that means uh, uh, even if we know okay, household identifiers and person identifier like this, we combine the feature vectors so of all uh, household members in the same household into one feature vector. And, and uh, the labels include uh, things like uh, age group and gender and so on. So what we want to do is basically uh, know uh, whether your household includes one or more uh, male or one or more females uh, and a uh, person with age group in, uh, age from age X to Y. So uh, it's basically uh, described here. And that was uh, made possible uh, thanks to the power of uh, Spark, MLLIP, and uh, uh, TensorFlow. And we used all those uh, power on the Databricks platform, the unified uh, data analytics platform. And when we use TensorFlow, uh, uh, we use TensorFlow through the Uber's open source project called Horovod. So, we, uh, uh, so using all those power on Databricks and, uh, uh, we, uh, and using the technology like ACR, Automatic Content Recognition, as well as EPG, the Electronic Program Guide, uh, you know, we were able to um, build a model yielding the result uh, with a very high accuracy. So what we do is uh, uh, we have a third-party data uh, having labels. Uh, by the way, uh, we don't have any uh, household, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the demographics labels, for example, gender and uh, age group. We don't have that information. But there are third-party vendors uh, who have that information. So we license the data. Uh, and their data looks exactly like uh, the ACL data, our proprietary data. So we try model using third-party with labels and uh, use um, the algorithms uh, available uh, through MLLIP and TensorFlow. We build many models, machine learning models train uh, the models, and then do cross-validation. And that's where we are right now. This is ongoing work. Uh, and you see the accuracy uh, here. What we want to do eventually is transfer that uh, learned model to uh, the actual uh, the proprietary data domain, the ACR specifically, and to do uh, the prediction. And why Databricks? Why we had to use uh, Databricks? Because it is very suitable for a wide range of user groups within Samsung. So Samsung is a, such a large corporation. Uh, there are half a million people worldwide uh, counting full-time employees only. So it's a, it's a massive uh, uh, organization. And there are many, many different groups uh, uh, stemming from the analytics groups or strategy groups. Uh, engineering groups, there are so many uh, different groups. Uh, we want to give them power to analyze the data and, and analysis of their interests, of course. And Databricks is pretty much interactive environment, so anyone can quickly learn and interact with uh, data that uh, we have. 
And it was cost effective to use Databricks because uh, based on our observation, uh, the process running time was faster. On average, it was uh, more than 50% faster. And it was more stable compared to uh, running jobs on AMR clusters on Amazon Web Services. Uh, so it was a wise decision to use uh, Databricks for, for that reason. And uh, another important aspect is end-to-end -end machine learning life cycles. So uh, since we are building a lot of machine learning models, we should have a way to manage uh, the London model efficiently. And uh, Databricks is working very closely with us to make that happen. Support for uh, distributed deep learning model training. Uh, although you have an option to use distributed TensorFlow, to build your model in parallel, uh, using Databricks is easier because uh, there is open source uh, called a Horrorboard. And using Horrorboard is very uh, easy it's like, uh, uh, to uh, build a model uh, using TensorFlow on Databricks. So every, everything was very seamless and we were very happy about using Databricks. So in summary, uh, I talked about hierarchical sessionization. That was first step to uh, transform machine-oriented data into uh, human-centric data. And, we, and I described Samsung taste graph. There was a way to um, uh, extract uh, insight on okay, what taste you have, what are the types of programs that you like, you usually watch. So, and there is pretty much a statistics-based. And we moved forward, we uh, uh, came up with the time sensitive features to do um, machine learning. And an application of time sensitive features were uh, proprietary time sensitive taste graph, uh, proprietary quality score, as well as uh, demographics predictions, which is uh, uh, running on a Databricks platform. So these are all about um, doing, I mean, using uh, data to better serve users. Uh, and better use uh, the, the huge amount of data we have. And future work, uh, potential future work will be, okay, understand user behavior. For example, since Samsung is a, uh, producing many different uh, kinds of devices, uh, collecting the uh, logs, turning the data on, uh, into smart data, and then get insight out of it, uh, that means wherever you go, uh, even if you're at home or even if you're at some venues or you, even if you are uh, moving in the car, we want to be able to capture okay, what you want. Uh, and that's uh, uh, essentially to serve you better. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> any, any questions? So we have a couple minutes for questions. Are there any questions before the next session? One question? Yep. I, I'm, you talked about the Cessnization earlier. I'm just wondering, how do you deal with or classify the proverbial channel flipper that every time there's a, there's a commercial that comes on, it's boom, different mm -hmm. channel? Yeah. Uh, so, so it's about actually HR technology. Um, so since um, uh, we know okay, what channel you're on, and uh, we know okay, what time that is in your local time, uh, we actually look up uh, information uh, within electronic program guide to see what exactly you're watching at a time, so that we know okay, what program title it was and, what, and so on, and how long you watched that program. Does that answer your question? OK, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, besides deep learning algorithm, did you use any other uh, algorithm to do the prediction? Uh, OK, we tried I, uh, two forms of uh, machine learning uh, algorithm. One is a general machine learning, for example, uh, logistic regression, random forest. And, and another form is deep learning. We don't actually try any specific type of uh, deep learning technologies. 
uh, we just had a normal, typical deep learning with uh, several layers to do the prediction. And those are uh, equally uh, likely at this moment. Okay, in terms and, of the performance. and the follow-up question on that is, did you use GPU for deep learning, or you just use a traditional CPU to compute? Yes, we do attempt to use GPU because it's faster to train the model. And uh, uh, when you use horror world, uh, it's easy to actually use GPUs. So use the power of GPU and the power of TensorFlow all come together and help us train uh, the deep learning model fast. Oh, OK, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, one more quick question. So we have the next group coming in, and then we'll wrap. Hey, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Uh, my question is, uh, when you do the test, uh, test graph, right, uh, you do the clustering, then how do you label those clusters? Uh, okay, so test graph is uh, relying on the Jungla information that electronic program guide uh, provides. So I mentioned ACR, and when you use ACR, uh, we know what program you watch it. And, and, and as a result, we also know what Jungla, the program, uh, was associated with. So test graph was a uh, 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 way to see what type of genres you were most interested in. And we combine similar genre into one, and that becomes a independent taste. So that uh, what taste you have, that's, that's the way that we know what taste you have. So are you, are you doing majority voting to get the label, or uh, is there an, any other ways to do this? Yeah, good question. Uh, so that's uh, okay. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, we, we do try to uh, do a majority voting, and only when we uh, have multiple machine learning models and to uh, predict uh, uh, demographical attributes. Since we have general machine learning models and deep learning model, it makes sense to do a majority voting uh, in the sense of uh, ensemble uh, approaches. So, uh, and that typically actually boosts off uh, accuracy. So we uh, attempt to do that too. And this is an experimental right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you again for a great talk. And if you have any additional questions, I'm sure Anthony will yeah. stick around for me. Yeah. Thank you very much.